I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. I'd like to uh, comment on the meditation briefly and then speak to a question that came in related to it and then move into my talk. So the comment I'd like to make is to in, uh, track the distinction. I think it's helpful to track the distinction in your experience when there's kind of a shift from having an experience to being that experience. In other words, there's kind of a shift from observing an open-heartedness which has maybe a subtle sensory component, maybe a feeling of related heartfelt emotion like friendliness or kindness, love perhaps. Okay, so there's the having of that experience. And then um, there might also be the experience of, oh, being present, being present, even present with an open heart. All right, and then there's this very interesting shift that I'm, that I'm marking here, in which we kind of shift and we find ourselves abiding as that, let's say, open-hearted presence, just simply as it, identity, in a sense, shifts. <clears throat> and that shift of identity, <clears throat> if we chase it, if we try to hold on to it, then it doesn't work. But if we, it's more like we open into it, land in it, come home there, it can be really quite powerful in our practice, right? The shift from having even a very beneficial focal experience, specific experience, fine, good, real good. And what happens when we abide as that, like abiding as open-hearted presence. And you can see other examples of this in different situations um, where we kind of shift and we it's like we abide as commitment to someone that we love. We're, we're just, we're fully given over. <laughs> we know we're abiding. Like, we are that commitment. We are that duty, that loyalty to them. And there's a shift, right? Anyway, I just kind of wanted to mark that shift and the, the shift of identity, uh, which is really quite fundamental, we, including leaving behind some of our conventional contracted identities. Uh, okay. Then I want to speak to a question that um, Elena offered at 41 minutes past the hour and Elizabeth um, seconded. Question being, uh, is there an anatomic neurological basis for instructions I often hear from various meditation leaders for feeling warm heartedness and other emotions in the area of the heart? Putting our hands on our hearts, chest, etc. And I've heard you and others speak of areas in the brain where old emotions get stored or triggered, um, such as, um, Let's see, do you have thoughts or feelings about us feeling heartache in our chest and or solar plexus areas? I have felt that with loss of loved ones, et cetera, like vagus nerve connections with the heart and the gut, da 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 da, da et cetera, right? Okay, um, a lot about that I'll be trying to succinct. Uh, I think a full scientific answer at the level of understanding the mechanics of the elbow, and then, which are very complicated, even um, we're far away from a full understanding scientifically, let's say, of your question. A uh, couple of things that I think are worth marking on the way into uh, my own response. One is just to appreciate the ways that we're culturally conditioned. And uh, there are just a lot of cultural conditioning that associates uh, 
you know, emotions that are relational, loving, and so forth with the area, the physical heart. It's just the languaging of heartfelt, right? Well, that cues us up to associate sensation in this middle of your chest with those particular feelings. That's a factor. Also, maybe energy systems in the body, electromagnetic fields that loosely associate with certain regions, call them chakras. Mm, maybe so. Maybe so. Maybe that's in the mix. Subtle electromagnetic fields. And then we have the vagus nerve complex. Briefly, lots can be said about it. I could probably turn over and grab Steve Porges book on polyvagal theory and his latest versions of that. Fantastic stuff. The short version is that essentially there are two branches. There's the original early one, which descends from the brainstem down into regulating the heart, lungs, and the viscera. And uh, that branch of the nervous system is very involved with the parasympathetic aspect of the autonomic nervous system, which is about preservation, maintenance, keeping us going, conserving resources, Resting and digesting is the acronym or the phrase for it. Resting and digesting rather than fighting or fleeing, which is more associated with the sympathetic branch, the more recent branch of the autonomic nervous system. The second branch of the vagus nerve complex rises up from the brainstem area and moves into the head. I think it becomes the 11th cranial nerve and is very involved with the social engagement system, including regulating uh, the operation of the inner ear, picking up subtle voice tones, uh, and so forth. Because these two branches are connected, when we start to have uh, emo social experiences, particularly you know, social experiences, the neurological dynamics of that ripple down as well. And there becomes a regulation of um, uh, our viscera and particularly our heart so that we can tolerate closeness and proximity, you know, with, with others of our kind. Because getting really, really close, you don't see lizards cuddling very much with each other, right? Getting close to another reptile could be kind of scary and dangerous unless it's right in the act of sex. So there's a kind of mixed process that occurs in our own human relatedness, primate relatedness, where we find ways to get close uh, without activating a flight or, or fight response, partly by slowing the heart and soothing and calming us down. So there's this interconnecting interconnecting. Uh, that's biological of the social engagement system and physiological regulatory processes that are extremely engaged with the heart. So in that sense, it wouldn't surprise me at all that there's a connectivity there and that um, it's a two-way street in which we can use positive relational experiences to calm and ease our physiology. One of the, you know, there are three major ways to come out of a spike of red zone stress. One is uh, physical pleasure. A second is a very marked sense of safety. A third is positive social connection. Because those three are mother nature's plan to help bring us down out of a spike of stress, red zone stress, which creates wear and tear on the body mind back down into the green zone as our home base and resting state. So um, in that way, positive social experiences, calm the heart, slow us down, go the other way. Um, perhaps uh, do things like HeartMath Institute teaches to bring a kind of what they call coherence, a kind of uh, rhythmic uh, changing of heart rate variability. Um, and as you do that, you might find yourself much more available to a relationship. Okay, so that's about, that's what I know. And I guess at the end of the day, I think what's useful is experimenting because um, it, there are lots of individual differences here and how we um, 
what we find in our own practice is, is what's most fundamental. Okay? And if you want to know more, I would totally encourage you to look into the work of HeartMath, uh, Steve Porges, Polyvagal Theory. Uh, check it out. Okay. Now, my talk. So, I've been wondering about something a lot. And I'll tell you a story about a recent interaction with someone. And um, this man grew up in a home in which one of the parents was alcoholic. And uh, starting at a really pretty young age, uh, he could perceive that his mom would yell more when she'd been drinking and that she often was sort of semi-passed out on the couch uh, in the afternoon when he'd come home from school. She, he was hungry, but she, was, you know, she couldn't fix him anything to eat. He, he started to notice it. And he began telling his dad uh, about his mom. It's, he's an adult. He's telling me the story. And his dad was a kind of traditional father, like, decent enough fellow, but very disengaged from family life. And the mom was very intense. She could be really kind of a powerful, angry character. And the dad just didn't want to rock the boat. So he would downplay it or he'd say, well, she just, yeah, she drinks a little too much sometimes, but not a deal. Uh, and, you know, on any given day, the dad tried to keep the peace. Okay. So, so this boy, you know, 10 years old, 13 years old, started learning about alcoholism and started trying to uh, under, you know, look up rehab uh, in the phone book, find out about it. And this boy talked not just to the dad, but to other relatives. Mom's got a real issue. What are we going to do? And nobody really did anything at all, actually. And mom's drinking got worse and worse and worse. And the boy, you know, went to high school, things didn't get better, finally went off to, you know, left home, went off to college, did various kinds of work. And I was talking with him about this. And and I asked him, well, how do you how do you look back on that young you, that 15-year-old boy, that 10-year-old boy? How do you regard that person? What do you feel toward that person? And quick as a wink, he replied, he should have done more. He should have tried harder. Or he, he replied partly too, I should have done more. I should have tried harder. And I was astonished because, um, first of all, in my clinical experience, he was making an effort as a 10-year-old, a 12-year-old, a 15-year-old that I've rarely heard of. I'm sure others have occasionally have that in their history. Um, but it's really pretty uncommon. Second, it's not his job to get his mom to stop drinking. That's her job. Or to some extent, uh, her husband's job or her partner's job, the kid's parent, the other parent, who has a duty to his children. It was their job to do something about it. As adults, it's the job of adults to wrap their arms around the, another adult who has a problem. It's not the job of the kids. And if it's in part because kids don't have the power, he could not make his mom be sober. He could not make his dad take her to a AA meeting. He could not um, find the money to pay for rehab, which was very expensive. Uh, because he had no power, he had no responsibility and therefore no blame. This is deeply important. If you do not have the power to make something better, you do not have any responsibility. You might have a responsibility to amend what I'm saying a little bit, to wish things well, to have positive intent, to bear witness. But if we can't make it better, it's not our fault if it continues. And you might really look to your own history here. And in a moment, I want to do a little bit of an exercise with you, kind of a psychological exploration, an experiential exploration of this. Uh, the Buddha is said to have said something that 
could be essentially paraphrased as, he, the Buddha, is saying, I looked throughout the entire universe and I could not find a being more worthy of support and care and concern than myself. Not because the Buddha is special, but because each of us has a profound duty to ourselves of care and concern. We are the one over whom we do have power and therefore the one to whom we have a great responsibility. How do we exercise this responsibility to ourselves? Do we do it in the way that this person, this man, does by being really hard on himself and cutting himself no slack, bringing no perspective to it, just pressuring, pushing, criticizing, demanding? Is that how we fulfill our duty to ourselves? Is that how you treat yourself? Or do we bring qualities of kindness, clear seeing, encouragement, perspective to ourselves, knowing the longings of our heart more keenly than we know the longings of anyone else? Can we back our own play? Can we keep faith with ourselves? We slip, okay. But then can we get back on the path of being a loyal friend, a steadfast ally to ourselves? What would that look like? Right? To me, this is right at the heart, actually, of uh, psychological healing and growing, and right at the heart of sustained spiritual practice, sustained effort on the path of awakening. Um, I think many people walk that path uh, sort of like sternly scolding themselves. Try harder, meditate longer, sin no more. And some of them become teachers with that kind of energy. And you know, harshness. Uh, yeah. You can stay on the path to some extent with a stick at your back, pushed by yourself. But uh, it's really unpleasant. And also it's demotivating and it's hard to sustain. Much more effective to encourage ourselves and to be drawn toward, you know, what we long for, as increasingly we abide as what we long to be. So as a bit of um, exploration into this, if you're up for it, I wanna try uh, an experiential practice probably in three or four steps, and then we'll open it up for some discussion about this, okay? So you ready to do a little experiential thing? It'll, it'll take about half a minute to a minute, the first one, all right? And I'm gonna do this at 10 year intervals. And by the way, if you find yourself getting triggered around this, it's okay to just step out of the experiential practice. Think of it as a kind of an inquiry about how you are toward yourself or, or how you could increasingly be. All right, so see if you can imagine yourself on the day you were born. Uh, you don't need to know the details. You could just imagine some basics that are probably true. Maybe you have a feeling for that little infant. Maybe you have a, even a sense of it way down deep inside yourself. For me, it, it's kind of visual. I'm, I'm sort of seeing that you know <laughs> little infant, me a long time ago, being born. Okay, let's be quiet here for a minute. What kind of attitude can you find in yourself now for that 
person you were on the day you were born. And I'll be quiet as you might discover some thoughts or some words, some blessings, some respect. Words of comfort or just a feeling in response to imagine looking into your own eyes on the day you were born. What is called from your heart today toward that little one you once were? What are some of the qualities you might already recognize in that newborn? Okay. Now, we'll just jump forward a decade at a time, around age 10, reflecting on what grade in school you might have been in, um, you, at around age 10, seeing that you, aware of some of the things you were dealing with at home and school, maybe your body, your health, don't know. All right, again, you're looking at that little kid, 10-year-old kid. What's your response to that 10-year-old kid you once were? What do you recognize in that you? And what is called forth from you? toward that you at age 10. Can you recognize perhaps some suffering inside that 10-year-old or some fears, some sadness, maybe. And what response comes forward in you today toward those sufferings? And what qualities, what strengths even can you can you recognize over there in that little in that ten year old? Are there communications to offer to that ten year old? And can you let those sink into you, down into the 10-year-old layers inside your own mind today? Let's jump ahead another 10 years. Now you're 20. 
I'll speed it up a little bit. If you uh, look at that 20-year-old version of you, ballpark, roughly what were you doing around that time? Roughly what did you look like? What were you dealing with? What was hard for you around that time? And is there compassion for what was hard for you then? And what are some of the strengths you can see in that 20-year-old? Admirable qualities. They don't need to be heroic to be admirable. And then one more, age 30. And if you're not yet 30, count your blessings. And also, you might imagine uh, a different age, if you like. So at 30, huh? where were you? What were you doing, roughly? What year was it when you were 30, roughly? What was hard for you then? What were you dealing with? If you knew the innermost life of that 30 year old, which you do, What words of kindness and support would you offer to that person? And what are some of the qualities of strengths you can see in that 30-year-old you? Come on. (laughs) What could you recognize in that 30-year-old you that is worthy of respect? Appreciation. And then to finish this here, now let's turn it the other way. Can you sort of take about a minute now and be the newborn, the 10-year-old, the 20-year-old, and the 30-year-old who has been receiving compassion from the present day you and has been receiving appreciation and respect from the present day you? (laughs) Can you let that in? Can you let it in?
to those deeper layers in yourself. And does something soften inside you and tenderize inside you? Maybe just beginning to. In establishing a tender, caring, ah, relationship with yourself. Okay. As we finish here, and I can see so many comments coming in through the chat, and um, I I want to kind of call out two things to notice if they're real for you, as some of the fruits of this sort of practice, which is about really shifting into a quality of, of um, compassion and appropriate appreciation for ourselves. One thing that happens is that we, when we do this, we stop being so hard on ourselves and we um, are able to hold ourselves to the same standards that we hold others to which, um, so we're not so hard on ourselves. That, that's one thing that happens. A kind of harsh, scolding, banging, punitive pushing goes away. What also happens is that because you have a sense of your own preciousness, not better than others, but just the, the preciousness of a human life, this human life, as you, um, you call yourself to a higher road. Because your life is precious, because you have a keen sense of how life lands on you, you realize, don't, you know, I don't need to do those things that self-medicated me, but they kind of degrade me, they kind of wear me down. No, I don't need to do that. I, I just don't need to get all caught up in those other things. I can let that go. I don't need to carry that resentment around. I'm, I'm being called to a higher road, you know? Not out of some kind of uh, highfalutin uh, um, <clears throat> pressure, but more just as if there's someone you really care about, you would help them and encourage them not to fall into the swamp, you know, or the fire pit uh, along the way, or to do stuff that would be harmful to their body or their mind. Draw them to a higher road. Okay, so I invite you to, as I finish here, to really kind of reflect on the, the Buddha's teaching about what happens if you regard yourself, I'll put it in this way, that you regard yourself as worthy of tremendous support, love and sweetness and kindness. Wow. How would you go through your day if you can if you regarded yourself in that way? If you felt that, if you felt a kind of stewardship of your own life. I think a lot. We'd be lighter, like being in a hot air balloon, tossing ballast off the sides, you know, letting go, the stuff that holds us down. Uh, okay. So I want to see if there's some specific questions related to this. I'm seeing lots and lots of confidence, I mean, uh, comments. Yes. Good. Great. So what do you make of this? You know? I'm really trying to get at something, perhaps ineptly, that 
is deeper than the standard stereotypical kind of treacly advice to, oh, be nice to yourself, treat yourself well, be good to you, right? This is, this is like, no, this is about feeling how it's been for you. And feeling it in, in kind of an, in the context of sacredness. And in that context, how do you want to be with yourself each day? So are there any questions or comments about this? I'm rolling through the chat here. I'm, I'm getting that you appreciate this reflection. I'm glad. I'm getting a lot out of it myself. Um, here's the thing, uh, being personal with you, uh, it, it was really a cool thing for me recently to realize that, uh, my younger version, you know, around like, um, I started seventh grade when I was 10. And so there I was, pretty shy, young, and so forth. And uh, just uh, I realized that if I had known me then, I thought I was a pretty cool kid. <laughs> and that, I mean, I didn't. When I was a kid, I did not think I was a pretty cool kid. And until really quite recently, I would never, I would not have said that I would look at that ten or twelve, fourteen-year-old version of me, and go, "You're actually a pretty cool kid," you know, with certain qualities. I'll spare you some of the details. They're like. That's really pretty cool, right? Can you bring that kind of authentic, uh, you know, down to earth appreciation of yourself at younger ages? And then what happens when you do? When like you kind of shift and you realize, and you're whatever you might say, your own languaging of it, huh? All right, <laughs> pretty all right, all right. Okay, great. So, oh, good. So, Elenice, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, asking you to unmute. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It was a very uh, great experience and challenging experience. Yeah. But um, the most interesting thing is that a few months ago, I have by intuition, I just uh, saw myself when I was a newborn. And I had the experience of seeing my parents happy with me, like they're amazing, they're all this beautiful kid, right? And this was very good to calm my heart. So it was oh. very good experience. So uh, uh, since then, I, I kind of uh, called this image in my mind and this is good for me. And now what you did, that was so amazing. Today I had this picture of me when I was 10 years old. Oh. <laughs> right here on my day on my dad yeah and then came with this experiment and i thought wow. this is so interesting because now i am on the other side right like instead of my parents yeah. seeing that beautiful baby now it's my turn to see that that newborn it was very difficult it was very difficult because i always felt unworth yeah. and i did a lot of uh, good work to get right to push myself right 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 so yes and i feel like this feeling of release and yeah. being, you know let it go and thank you for all your oh, work thank you a fan of you oh very good <laughs> I have thank been you. Following you since 2018 i love you oh well thank you yeah oh you're most welcome and yeah I, i've not i don't believe you've ever spoken up in here before so it's good to see you yeah okay take good care yeah yeah, I think some of the experiential aspects of this may be a kind of melting inside, a kind of softening maybe. Um, now, I want to be kind of specific. Some people have shared, and you can see it in the chat, uh, feelings of being depressed or despairing in the exercise. And like any exercise, you know, things can come up. Um, What's interesting is, can we find compassion for ourselves, including at different ages? And can we find clear seeing, right? 
because there are always things to see in a 10-year-old, a 20-year-old, a newborn, a 30-year-old, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, and so forth. There are always things to see that are that are worthy and good. We might despair that we struggle to see that, but we, if we keep making efforts, we can find it, right? Yeah. So let's see here. Comments, questions. I appreciate that this can be difficult to bring a quality of compassion and appreciation to ourselves. Got it. If it's difficult, it just means we need to practice at it. You know, it's it's a path. There's there's a place for training. There's a place for effort. We can do it. Great. Yeah, I'm reading the comments. Um, yeah, great. Well, uh, yeah. Well, I see that this really stirred up some things in some people, and I I want to say again, I I really I I'm sorry about that, and. Um, When we contact some of what it was like for us as a young person, sometimes we we contact trauma, neglect, a lot of pain, lost years, to be sure. And for me, I phrase this as a kind of invitation that however it was like for ourselves back then, Um, can we bring qualities of compassion to ourselves, right? Compassion to ourselves for the years that were lost or compassion to ourselves for how we were mistreated and how much it hurt, how unfair it was. Can we find that compassion? And in the compassion is the sweet alongside the bitter. This is profoundly important. In compassion is the bitter of empathy for suffering, including in this case, let's say, empathy for the suffering of the infant or toddler, preschooler, little kid you once were. Okay, it's painful, sad. And can we mobilize the sweet of the kindness the tenderness for ourselves at that young age? Can we find the sweet of lovingness, you know, a respect for that young version of ourselves? In the sweet is a healing. Technically in the brain, there are reward molecules, natural opioids that are involved with the sweet aspects of compassion. But that's very important, yeah. I mean, gosh, when we just reflect on most childhoods, it's a mixed bag, right? And um, sometimes it's not even a mixed bag. It's just one big bag of shit, period, sometimes, some people. And, um, And yet I'll just offer that something that for me is very central is to find the through line of respect for that being we were. And it's kind of like a line, a certain, I'm going to use a loaded word, nobility, a kind of purity, a kind of uh, inherent goodness that runs through our life. Can we, can we like feel that and find that and, and, and have support for ourselves? You know, and then finishing. Just can we bring support for ourselves today? Whatever was the past today. Anyway, so I better finish here. So I think Meredith, if it's okay, I'm sorry. I better finish, you know, at half past the hour. Next time maybe, okay, yeah, thanks. Um, okay, all right. So um, 
Yeah. 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 It's kind of a key question. You know, if you really felt just the tenderness of yourself as a being, and you really brought a kind of like real valuing, even cherishing to yourself, how would you treat yourself? And how would you guide yourself through your day? That question is going to be very alive for me as well. Okay.